Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for this week's show is a real estate investment expert, Matt Pacheni. Now, Matt has more than 15 years of experience in property analysis, financing, acquisition, construction, operations, and has invested in more than 8,000 apartments nationwide. He's a licensed real estate agent, a Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac approved buyer, and has earned both commercial real estate and real estate finance certificates from Boston University. Matt is also a member of the Forbes Real Estate Council, the Fast Company Executive Board, and is an advisor to Prop and is an advisor to a prop tech company. And so with that, guys, it's my honor to welcome my guest for today's show, Matt Pacheni. How you doing, my friend? I'm good, Kevin. How are you? Good, good. I'm excited to have you here. Excited to learn about your very diverse background. I didn't even really touch on it in that introduction there. And so I'm going to let you share a little bit more of your background with our listeners for those folks that aren't aware of you and uh, ultimately how you found your way into real estate. So if you could, uh, Matt, please share a little bit more about yourself. Sure, Kevin. Um, you know, for me, this all started back in 2001. So if you could remember back 2001, the dot-com bubble had just burst. Um, I was working in digital marketing at the time and a lot of my clients were going out of business. And uh, my landlord came to me and told me I had 90 days to get out of the apartment I was living in. Hmm. So I mean, it really hit me like a ton of bricks. So I needed to figure out in 90 days, what was I gonna do? Ultimately, uh, what ended up happening was I found I was given a job actually by one of my clients offered me a, a job to come in house and work there. And I found a place, but instead of finding a place to rent, I found a place to purchase. Uh, fast forward about two and a half years, I ended up selling the place and the equity, my initial investment in the property had quadrupled. Wow. Yeah. So it was like a huge light bulb moment for me. And I was like, wow, I, I really need a, a get more involved in this real estate thing. Um, you know, that was a primary residence, but uh, I actually used uh, the profits to move into a new primary residence now in a part of town that I, that I really wanted to live in. The, the first one was, was a, a fine part of town, but just not my, 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 uh, my location of choice. Mm -hmm. um, but then I started investing in real estate. Uh, I bought a property, uh, a, a, a a piece of almost raw land uh, up in Connecticut. I, I live in New York City, so about a two-hour drive away. Um, I bought some land and then eventually uh, developed that land and, and built a house there. Uh, that was my first investment property. And that's what really set me on the track to where I am today because it was initially intended to be a vacation home that I would rent from time to time. I ended up renting that place out uh, a lot more than just time to time. It became a full-time rental. I learned a lot of things back then um, and continued to do real estate as a hobby for, for about 10 years uh, before transitioning into doing real estate full-time. Uh, and that's what I do now. I'm a full-time real estate investor. I, I invest as a limited partner and also as a general partner, um, focusing primarily on multifamily apartment buildings across the nation. Okay. I appreciate that. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, your first real investment that, you know, the, the development there in Connecticut and um, you probably couldn't have picked the, uh, the, the harder path uh, to, to, to doing your first deal, which is buying a piece of raw <laughs> land, actually developing it. Right. And it's interesting that you say about the, uh, you know, the vacation rental, you had intended you know, to use it and ultimately offset your costs just by, you know, renting it for a period of time throughout the year. And then you start seeing those dollar signs and the demand for that product. And ultimately it never became a vacation rental for yourself. But I think you probably made the smart decision and, uh, and kept it as a rental, built up that equity and, you know, kept parlaying that into future investments. So uh, kudos to that very first deal, because that's all, that's a foundation. And again, you picked a, a little bit more of a challenging foundation to build than, than most do. And so what I love to, uh, to dive into, and you, you didn't even gloss over, you didn't mention it at all, is that you've also been an actor, okay? Like you're, you're a Tony Award-winning actor, uh, I think co-producer, if I can recall from your bio, co-producer of two um, popular Broadway hits, uh, one being Moulin Rouge and the other being American Utopia. And so you didn't mention that part of your life, but I would love to dive in a little bit, if, if you wouldn't mind, as to how that fits into this whole picture. 
Sure, sure. Well, so, you know, I, I just won those two Tonys this summer. Okay. Um, and anyone who's watching on a video can see them right behind me. Um, as, as a co-producer with my wife uh, on, on those shows, I, I never did win a Tony as an actor, unfortunately. I really wanted to, um, but it's nice to have, to have gotten that now. So, you know, I, I did start off as an actor. Um, you know, my first paying job was at Walt Disney World. Uh, when I was around 11 years old, I had auditioned and, and, and got um, into this show that was performed right in front of the castle at the Magic Kingdom. Uh, and, and that was my, my very first ever paycheck. I remember my parents putting it up on the refrigerator. <laughs> um, and uh, from there, you know, I was doing a lot of acting while I was in high school uh, and doing community theater and, and things of that nature. I moved to New York City. So I grew up in Orlando, Florida, moved to New York City in 1991 uh, to pursue a career, a full time career in theater and uh, went to the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in New York, graduated from there. And three days after graduation, I was off on tour. Um, I had been auditioning during my final semester at school and got a gig. And so I was off on tour, um, touring throughout the country and spent about five years. Uh, and I was in 15 different productions throughout the country, um, tours and, and regional theater. And it was amazing. I really enjoyed it. It was a fantastic part of my life. Um, I also got very interested in the internet um, at that time and found it to be a little bit more lucrative uh, to do those types of projects and was still around the same type of creative energy and creative people. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, especially back in those early dot-com days, were musicians and actors and singers and dancers. And so it was um, a way for me to keep sort of the same cultural uh, vibe, if you will, um, but still be able to have something a, a little more steady. And it was never a conscious decision of I'm not going to act anymore. It was instead of waiting tables at the Hard Rock Cafe, which is what I was doing in between acting gigs, it's like, well, I can actually work normal hours uh, and, and make better money than waiting tables and not be waiting tables, which for me wasn't really my cup of tea. Um, then I had an opportunity through that to actually start my own company doing web development projects. And uh, that's what kind of set me on the path of uh, more of a career in digital marketing versus, you know, sort of kind of leaving the acting world behind, not really consciously, it just kind of happened organically. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the, the, the theatrical background there. It was awesome. I really enjoyed it. Um, and it, it was at that time when I had my own little agency. I had my own little company in New York um, that the dot-com bubble burst. And that's mm. uh, that, that story I told you a little earlier. Yeah, sure. So I, well, I appreciate you sharing that background. So I, I'd love to get a better understanding of, of your dive into multifamily. And uh, I know initially you got started on the LP side. You've since um, acquired uh, quite a number of units, I think over 2000 units on the GP side of things. And so you've done what I, what I think is a, is a, is a, um, you know, what, what I think is a very good business model for folks that are looking to get into larger scale projects, you know, speaking to multifamily projects and it's get your, get in, get on the LP side, understand the mechanics behind the scenes as much as you can get with some good sponsors that are willing to maybe peel back the curtains a little bit, peel back the onion and, and let you take a peek into what's happening. How's a good sponsor run their business? How's a maybe a, a mediocre sponsor run their, how they run their business and take the good and the bad from each and ultimately do that before going out and, uh, and looking to do it, you know, more so on your own, right? And actually put a team together and do it on your own. And so I'd love to maybe fr from, from you hear exactly what that looked like from the start and then leading up to now where you're actually going out and buying your own deals. And again, I think you, correct me if I'm wrong, you've got over 2000 units at present um, as form of GP status and uh, have done, you know, quite a number of deals and are, are chugging forward at a very fast pace. Um, thanks. Yes, Kevin, that's right. It's a, it's a little over 2,300 units that I have as a general partner. Um, and for me, I, uh, I went in and I, I joined one of those guru groups, right? Um, I got a mentor and it was the best thing that I, that I did, I think yeah. for my career, you know, they say that joining one of these groups can collapse timeframes. And I think that really did for me. 
Um, there was an educational component to it, which was fantastic, but there was also the networking component, which was instrumental. Um, through those relationships that I was able to build with different people, I was able to find out about other opportunities that I could invest in from an LP perspective. So I was always dual tracking this business um, from the beginning where I had done a number of, you know, the vacation rental that I talked about, some single families that I had lived in. I had some turnkey single families. I had some fix and flips. So I had been an active investor, um, but the, the most multifamily I had bought was a duplex, right? And I wanted to scale that up, but I didn't know how to get enough capital to do that. I learned about syndication, went to some seminars, found a group that I felt comfortable with, joined that group, um, and um, was able to meet individual sponsors and develop relationships with them. You know, one of the things that I always tell people about is that um, the most important thing, as you know, Kevin, is, is the operator, right? I mean, that's why a lot of your investors go with you. You've got a great reputation. They've talked with you. They get to know you. They feel comfortable, and they go ahead and invest in your deals. For me, uh, you know, a, a newbie at that point, um, I needed to meet with different people and feel comfortable with them, feel comfortable to give them fifty, a hundred thousand dollars of my money. Um, that was that was a that was really big for me at the time. I never spent that kind of money on uh, a, a, a single investment. I had used it to purchase homes, but not like to to give someone yeah. and hope that they're going to take, you know, be a good steward of that capital. Yeah. So uh, through, through meeting those people and, and having those relationships, I, I was able to, to, to feel confident investing with them. And you're right. Learning part of it was this learning aspect. I wanted to see how they were running their deals, how they were communicating with their investors, what sort of reporting were they doing? And just as you mentioned also earlier, it was taking the good and the bad. And, and learning lessons of, yes, I want to do that. And I definitely don't want to do it that way. So um, I learned a lot through that experience. But I was also at that time looking for my first um, deal that I, could, that I could sponsor, that I could bring mm -hmm. to my investors. And um, it took a long time, Kevin. It took me two years to find my first deal. Now, part of that was there was a learning curve during that. But for, if I look at you know, the date that I, that I started that program, joined that program to the day I, I closed on my first deal. It was about two years. The, the thing that was interesting was the first deal that I closed on was 132 units. It was a $10 million property. Mm -hmm. So it, it confirmed sort of my thesis is that, you know, I was buying these little couple hundred thousand dollar single family properties if I had continued doing that for that two year period, there's no way I would have closed on 132 of them and, and amassed a $10 million uh, asset. And so um, that, that's, that's basically how, how I got started on it. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And I'm going to go, I'm going to back up a little bit to, you know, r really betting on, on operators and sponsors, finding the good ones to place your capital with. It's a big decision for anyone to make, uh, you know, that, that first 50 or first hundred thousand dollar investment, even if you've got a huge, huge net worth and you're incredibly liquid, it doesn't matter. You know, really what it comes down to is you're betting on a horse for the most part. And really what, what are you looking for in that horse? You're looking for a track record, you know, uh, proof of concept that's, you know, and, and maybe you bet on a couple first deals, but you know, most of the time when I'm looking to put my money as an LP, I'm, I want to know what that track record looks like. I want to know, you know, very intricate details of deals they've gone full cycle on. And I want to know what the rest of their team looks like and where are the strengths and where are the weaknesses at and find where the cracks might lie. Cause every business has cracks, every business has voids, no business is absolutely perfect, but I want to know all those things. Cause again, at the end of the day, you are making a bet, but it's, it really is on that, that sponsor, you know, it's a sponsor and the deal, but it could be a phenomenal deal. You know, it could be a $10 million property you pick up for five, but if it's a horrific sponsor and they don't know how to run their business efficiently, then they're going to basically throw away all that equity because they're going to run it into the ground. Right. So um, yep. it, it, it's absolutely <laughs> a big decision. So what were some of those things as you were on the LP side of things? Cause you've done a, a just a, a fairly large number of LP uh, transactions what were some of the, um, you know, not so great things that you saw that you surely didn't want to replicate in your own business as you started doing more on the general partner side? Would you mind sharing? 
Sure. And you don't have um, to surely don't mention names or anything like that. I just, uh, <laughs> I, you know, you, again, you've looked at a lot, and, and, but I want to hear from your perspective. I've talked about this many times in the past, but I'd love to hear from your perspective. Some of the things that you chose not to replicate in your own business and other, you know, positive traits, you saw all the things that they were doing that were phenomenal, that you thought were great, and you'd like to, you know, introduce them to your very own business. Sure. So, you know, I look at all deals is sort of that there's three components to them, right? I talk about it uh, in, in the book that I have where I talk about it's the deal, it's the market, and as you said, most importantly, the sponsor. So, I mean, there are things that I have found across all three of those where um, there's been some positives and also some negatives. You know, when it, when it comes to the sponsor, let's start there. Um, you know, people who are communicative. Um, for me, especially starting off, um, I wanted someone who was going to uh, be willing to, to talk with me and give me a little bit of extra attention. I was very, very careful to not be obnoxious about it, but um, would speak with the sponsor and let them know, hey, listen, you know, I, I want to sponsor these deals myself. Would it be okay if, you know, from time to time, not consistently, I, I were to, you know, maybe pick your brain. And, and these were people who I had become already sort of friendly with, like outside of the real, yeah, I met them through real estate, but we had developed a, a relationship and a rapport. So it made it more comfortable. So that was nice. Um, and so the way that people react and the way sponsors talk to me and, and uh, you know, how long it takes them to get back to me and the sort of information, uh, how transparent they are, those are all things that are positive. And so when I saw that, uh, I said, I want to go ahead and do that. I want to make myself accessible. I want to have clear and consistent reporting that I'm giving to my investors. Um, some things that I didn't like, I mean, I invested in, in a deal with, with a friend who it was more of almost like a JV. It was a really small thing, but I mean, we ended up doing really well at the end, but there was no communication. There was no reporting. And I was always like, Hey, you know, how, how are we doing? Like, is, is everything good? Like it's been eight months since I've heard anything, oh, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't like that. Um, I also, you know, warn, I warn in the book about, sponsors who are sort of bending and breaking the rules a little bit. And, um, you know, when it comes what to do you mean by compliance. That? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to, for you to speak to that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, <clears throat> there are rules and guidelines that you're supposed to follow from an SEC perspective. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And for me, I, um, it's something that I, that I want to do. I want to follow those rules to a T. I, I, that's just the kind of guy that I am. And I know some people may bend them. And so, so what rules am I talking about? Well, most of the deals that I do or, and that I see out there are 506B or 506C. Now for a 506B, you're supposed to have a pre-existing substantive relationship, but I know guys that are out there that, you know, will have a deal under contract and they're raising money and they meet someone right away and, and offer that up to them. And you're not supposed to do that. Um, you're also not supposed to just raise capital for a deal. You're supposed to actually have material participation and have a role and be involved. And, um, you know, those kind of situations um, are ones that I just avoid. I avoid the ones that are sort of bending the rules a little bit because my own thought as a limited partner in these is if they're bending the rules when it comes to SEC, what other rules are they maybe bending? You know, are they being a little loose maybe in some of the underwriting and some of their assumptions? Like it just doesn't. Um, I would answer that question is yes. Uh, seriously, I would. I mean, like, no, I'm dead serious. Those two rules that you mentioned that get broken quite often. Um, it, it's it's actually rampant now. I feel in in, in this in, in in the industry, and I'll speak to you know multifamily or even mobile home parks now because I you know there's a ton of mobile home park syndicators out there, and um, it's just again I, I don't know how many, but it's rampant. So it it just goes to you know do your homework, folks. I mean, if you're looking at a particular sponsor, don't invest in them just because they had pretty marketing. You saw it on a Facebook ad, or you heard them interviewed on a podcast. Like don't you got to do your own deep diving or don't, don't just interview or don't just invest with them. Cause you, you heard someone else invested with them and they did great. Maybe on another deal, do your own research, do your own deep dive. At the end of the day, you mentioned your buddy, you invested with him. 
you know, more of a JV deal, but the communication was horrific. That is, you know, you didn't like that, but it's okay because a rising tide lifts all boats, right? And uh, the market's been going up, 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 and you got your money back and you did quite fine on that investment and, uh, you know, washed your hands of it, took that money and redeployed it somewhere else. But things would probably have been a lot different if that investment would not have uh, met projections or had, you know, fell very short of projections. And then on top of that, there was no communication, right? That's where it gets really, really sticky. And so, I, I mean, communication, whether it's, Good, bad, or indifferent is literally one of the key uh, attributes that we that we seek, and that's really what we try to provide all of our investors. We over communicate. I think it's critically important when things are going great. It's even more important when things are going not so great with an individual deal or or you know multitude of deals. So, um, but no, I think that those two two things, the two big red flags, um, they run, unfortunately run rampant, and uh, there's a lot of capital flowing out there looking for a home, and some of that capital. Is is not necessarily. I'm not going to call it irresponsible capital, but it's it's um, it's capital from from folks that have not spent time doing their homework. You know, they just haven't spent time doing their homework. It sounds like you're very you're very diligent, and you probably took a good bit of time. You joined these groups, you talk, you you just you got deeply ingrained before you just started making uh, you started making haphazard decisions with your with your money. And um, in any event, that's it's a. Uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Cause that's that's. It's definitely um, some valid points for folks that are listening to take away from this if they're out there looking to place their capital with uh, with operators. So um, I want to talk to you about, uh, Matt, if, if we could, about the markets that you guys are investing in. Uh, and really, I guess the best way to frame the question would be, you know, what, what markets or regions are you bullish in today? Where are you trying to spend most of your focus and time? Um, today, uh, we're, yes. we're pretty squarely in, uh, focusing for going into 22, 2022 uh, in, in Dallas, uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth market, we really like a lot. Um, we have a lot of assets in Houston. I like Houston as well. Um, we had a bunch of assets in Kansas City. That market, in my opinion, has gotten a little overheated. I really like it a lot. I continue to look for opportunities there, um, but the um, prices that people are willing to pay in that market uh, make it uh, a little uh, challenging for my underwriting to pencil out. Mm -hmm. uh, Dallas is still very hot as well. I'm just able to find deals that pencil there. Yeah. Let's talk about that, finding opportunities in such a competitive landscape, right? I mean, again, yeah. we, we speak to how much capital is flowing out in the marketplace. There, you know, I always like to say there's always, there's, most of the time, there's always someone or more than one that's willing to pay more than you for a particular deal. And so how have you found, uh, you know, what, what is your strategy of, of winning out and being awarded an opportunity uh, when there's multiple other parties that are maybe willing to pay equal or to maybe even more than what you are? So what, what have you found yeah. to be the strategy? Well, Kevin, for, for us, for our success over the past year or so, you know, I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, how are you getting deals? Like, how is that possible? Um, and when deals usually go out on the open market, um, we, we do find it challenging. Um, but sometimes uh, through the relationships that we've built over the years, um, through consistency in being able to to uh, find deals, execute on them, get to the closing line. We've developed a reputation um, with certain brokers and, and rep, you know, a relationship with these brokers and property managers. Um, and that has allowed us more recently to be able to see properties before they hit the market. You know, it's, it's not these, yeah, I always hear about these magical off market deals that, can happen from time to time, but what usually happens is a scenario I'm gonna tell you about um, right now, the latest deal that we closed on, where uh, we had a relationship with the broker, uh, one, one, of the, the, one of the partners on the GP team actually uh, was, was friendly with this person and known them for years and done, done business with them for years and found out that this new property was coming to market. And what happens with these properties when you're working with a broker is uh, that they'll gather all the information together uh, and then they will, they will take them a few weeks to actually put the entire marketing package together. They usually have a marketing team and they do, you know, it's nice and, and beautiful PowerPoint presentation that shows all the information and they're gathering the latest data from the market just to make sure it's all there. And, and, and it's great. And, and I'm glad that they do it. 
Um, in this particular case, um, we were fed the all of that information in its raw format. So we didn't um, get the glossy marketing package quite yet. It was coming, but we were able to get the T12 and the rent roll, right? The T12, mm -hmm. just for those who don't know on the on your podcast, the trailing 12 months of profit and loss. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, those are the two pieces of information that we really need to, to go ahead and analyze a deal. We were able to analyze the deal and come up with, with a number that made sense to us. We spoke with the broker um, the brokers, while there's usually no listing price per se, you can usually ask them and find out sort of some what they might call pricing guidance or a whisper price is what they call it sometimes. When we found out the whisper price on the property, which was right in line with our uh, with what our underwriting showed us would be acceptable. So we put together an LOI, which is a letter of intent to go ahead and, and purchase the property and presented that to the broker who in turn presented it to the seller. On the very day actually that the property hit the market, our LOI had a three day uh, period for them to accept or uh, decline. Um, but the broker knows and we let the broker know and he communicated to the seller that we're extremely active and we're looking for other opportunities in the market. And that if the seller were to wait, you know, it's usually like six to eight weeks between the, 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 the property going out on market and then they do a call for offers and a best and final that at that point it was very likely and this was this wasn't bs we weren't bluffing this is really the truth we would most likely be on to another deal at that point right so they had three days to make a decision on it and we were offering what they had wanted um what the broker felt that it was worth and had sold, told the seller we think this is what we can sell it for and here you are with someone we had closed transactions with the broker before he knew us very well um, and he said to the seller, this is what you're asking. We know these, this team, we know they do things well, they may not be interested in the future. And so the seller took it. And so that doesn't always work out that way. Yeah. You know, sometimes the seller's like, well, I'm in no rush and I think it's a competitive landscape and I'm just going to hang tight and see where things go. Um, but for this particular seller, it made sense to, to move forward with us. And, and we did close on the property and, it's actually been going very well. We're happy with that one. Do you, do, yeah. do you have any idea who the, you know, the profile of the seller? Was it just a, you know, a mom and pop that owned this and, or maybe this and maybe one other or two other apartment complexes? No, was it was a larger investment group. It was a larger investment group. Okay. Yeah. And what are the reasonings? So I uh, think they had a, I think they had an idea yeah. of what they were going to get. Yeah. Um, and, and the broker and us, and we were all right around that, you know, give or take maybe a hundred K we were all right around that same valuation. So for them to go ahead and, 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 you know, have a sh surety of clothes and just move forward. It just made sense. And so what's your business plan that how's your business plan differ than that of uh, the prior group, the seller, you know, uh, they, they obviously took it to a certain point. You feel like there's still a good bit of uh, untapped upside there. And what is that upside yeah. and, and um, or perceived upside and ultimately why do you feel that the seller chose not to um, go after the upside themselves? Oh, you know, I, I, I can't speak for them, but I can speak for me. Sure. Um, we have a property right now that's on the market. We just accepted an offer on it. Um, we have upgraded, uh, I think about 20% of the units. Mm -hmm. um, we've able, we've been able to sort of prove out, our, our business model, right? Our business plan. And we've had the property for two years. So, you know, our business plan is a six year business plan, five, five to six years. So for us, you know, do we go ahead and wait five to six years and then look to sell then, or do we look to sell now? And, um, you know, it, the consensus was, look, cap rates have compressed in the past two years in that particular submarket. Um, we don't know if they will stay that compressed. Um, we've proven a business model. And if we can capture some of that additional premium without actually spending the money to renovate those units, not all of it, you know, we, we leave some meat on the, we do this with all of our properties. We leave some meat on the bone for the next guy or gal who's coming down the pike, right? Who, um, Kevin, are, are we still good? My connection was unstable for yeah. a second there. Yep, you're okay. good. Okay. So just waiting for a, a little, uh, 
leaving some meat on the bone for the next guy or gal who's coming down the pike so that they can have a profit as well. You know, my philosophy, my ethos in all of this is trying to make win-wins. And, and so that's a win for, for me. It's a win for our investors and it's a win for our residents. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's really important to me is making sure that, that we're, we're making our, our property ownership actually improves the community and not degrades it. Um, I think that you can be an ethical business person and do things that are improvements and not be a slumlord and still make a lot of money. And so that's one of the things we do. We end up, it seems, purchasing properties from people who didn't, who, who sort of ran down the quality of services in many cases. And so the tenants end up loving us because we make the property nice and mm -hmm. we, we take care of their trouble tickets and we cure all that deferred maintenance and all of that kind of thing. Um, but getting back to the point, it makes a lot of sense for us from a business perspective to go ahead and exit a deal early if we can capture some of that upside without actually even doing that work. Sure. Um, and I think that that may be where that um, owner was, right? For, for this community, they had upgraded, they had done like a, like a partial upgrade, not the full upgrade that we would do on about, I think somewhere around 40% of the units. Mm -hmm. But for us to come, for them to, to do like a full upgrade and get the rents where they could um, would take them many, many, many years. Because I don't know anybody who kicks out everybody in an apartment complex, right. right? And have their occupancy go through. So you have to wait for renewals to come up and you wait hopefully for, you know, most of the part for some like natural attrition at the property. And so it just takes a long time and a good amount of capital, right? A large, you were talking millions of dollars to renovate when you have a large number mm -hmm. of units. And um, if someone can just take a nice profit after two years, you know, one, one third of the way through, like in our case, one third of the way through our business plan, it makes sense for us to go ahead and exit. We don't have the risk of cap rates going up. We don't have the risk of something happening with the, with the interest rates, um, you know, with the, with the entire real estate market, you know, faltering um, or that market falling out of favor for one reason or another takes a lot of risk off the table. Yeah. And I'm assuming this deal that you're speaking to that you're exiting out of right now, was that a, a what is that going to be a bridge the perm type uh, a, a, of loan structure? Or what do you have on it right now that you're able to exit out without any type of uh, your prepayment or, or defeasance or, or is there, I guess, I mean, I shouldn't assume that. Well, no, the question is, is there, because it's not yeah. actually, this yeah. was a property that we have agency debt on that we thought we were going to hold for the longer term. Okay. Um, but the so market has become, so strong that um, even considering a prepayment and a pretty hefty prepayment penalty, it's still going to make sense for us mm -hmm. to exit this deal. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And no, we, we and are we, doing we've had a few that some, way. yeah, this is that we hadn't not intended on exiting and uh, had had some type of either defeasance or prepayment, but it still made sense to sell even with the penalty in place. So no, I absolutely get it. So I, what are you look? How are you underwriting deals today? You know, I, you know, you know, just speaking to Dallas Fort Worth, and I didn't, I don't know the exact um, uh, statistics as as far as like w rents have gone crazy in, in many markets across the country. You know, I'm in the Tampa Bay area; they're they're up like 20, 25 percent, or you know, year over year over the last year, I guess eighteen months or so. And Dallas Fort Worth is probably very similar. Obviously, that's not going to continue forever. And so, how are you trying to mitigate that that risk? How, what does your underwriting look like for years two, three, four, five, and and what have you, as far as um, more nominal rent increases? Yeah, I mean, it's just that it's more nominal. Yeah, um, we look. We're looking at third party data to understand historic. Mm -hmm. where things have been, and I'm not talking about just the past five to 10 years, but historically where things are, have been, and, um, you know, what these analysts are projecting, um, and, and taking a very conservative bent on it. Um, you know, I look historically at what cap rates have been in a market, you know, in, in, in Dallas, you know, depending on what market you, you're looking at, um, a, a lot of the properties that we're seeing are trading around a four cap, but traditionally, you know, that might be trading at a five to six cap. So we're projecting exits in, in five years from now at maybe a five to a six cap, just mm -hmm. as an example, right? And this is sort of some rough ballpark numbers. Um, we'll look at vacancy in an area. 
vacancy has maybe, maybe it's 4% right now, but it's traditionally been 8% in that market. So we're going to go ahead and, 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 and run physical vacancy at 8%. Um, or, you know, we might be looking at something where rent growth has been phenomenal for the past five years, but they're projecting it to slow down. And historically it's, it's lower. It's 2%, let's say. So we're going to, we're going to go ahead and underwrite 2%. It doesn't allow us to get a lot of deals. I mean, Kevin, I don't get that many deals a year. Um, you know, I get two, three deals a year. Quality I mean, that's quantity. it. <laughs> yeah. And so we, we just take a pragmatic approach to this. Um, and you know what? If I don't do a deal in 2022, that's perfectly fine. You know, I, I have enough properties under my belt to keep me busy. But even before that, um, as you mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm an active LP, right? So I have two thirds of my portfolio in limited partner investments. Um, I've also invested in some Broadway shows as well. Um, so through my other investments, now I'm, I, don't, I don't need to do a new deal and get some acquisition fees so that I can put food on the table, right? Sure. And, and so that's, that's important to not, I don't have to do anything which allows yeah. me to take that really pragmatic approach. That's a good, good, good position to be in. And I want to switch gears, Matt, before we uh, work to wrap things up here. And, and um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a b big fan of retrading, whether it's on the buying or the selling side. And uh, we, all, we ultimately never go into a deal with the intent of retrading. I know that might be a strategy of some, um, but it's, uh, it's definitely not a winning strategy in today's world. But inevitably, there's, there's been deals um, that... Uh, we just literally just killed a deal the other day. Um, probably one of the uh, probably probably one of the most challenging sellers I've ever dealt with, and ultimately uh, discovered that there was a lot of fraudulent financials, doctored financials that were provided to us, which was the first of all the years I've been in this business. Uh, in any event, uh, it, it required a retrade, and it which ultimately killed the deal. It was a fairly significant retrade based on real data versus the. Dr. Datum. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an anomaly, I would say, in my space. And I, I have not heard of this egregious nature of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of Dr. Financials uh, in, in the past. But uh, anyway, so but the, speaking to retrading or speaking to challenges, uh, unforeseen challenges of any one given deal, there's still things that pop up, right? There's things that might pop up that are so significant that can't be overcome with just a simple reduction in price and that ultimately you'll push you to, uh, you'll kill the deal, move on from that deal, move on to the next one. I mean, maybe you haven't had any like that, that you've gone into due diligence on or took a bit deeper dive and then said, Hey, like red flag here, red flag there. This isn't what I thought it was. Ultimately at any price, this really isn't a good fit for us. We're going to move on to the next deal. If there is a deal like that, would you mind sharing maybe the reasons that you decided to walk and, and move on to the next? I wish I had a really good story to okay. tell you. Um, what I can say is that um, I've, a lot of these deals that we're doing require a large uh, deposit, right? Hard money, non-refundable money. Hard money. Um, yep. Yeah. Before, before due diligence, mm -hmm. right? At, at the time that you sign the purchase and sale agreement. So we try as much as we can, and we can't see everything, we can't like scope sewer lines and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we really try to be, um, to, 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 to do our homework as much as we can. Um, you know, one of the, one of our general partners uh, is a, uh, is a general contractor. So he's got a really good eye. Um, we still hire third party inspectors, you know, through due diligence, but we've, um, We've, we haven't gotten ourselves yet into a situation where we had to retrade. Um, we have gotten into a situation uh, once where there was something that we found that we didn't know and we brought it up to the seller and the seller agreed and, and we did change the, the price because there was some, the information that we were given ahead of time was sort of misleading. Yeah. And so, you know, I feel like, if there are things that can't be seen by the naked eye or there are things that, that, that a seller is hiding um, that, that then come out, I think retrading is fine in that case because there was something that was being concealed or, or, sure. or not exposed, right? Um, 
but in most cases that doesn't happen doesn't, in which case right. <laughs> you know you might find little there's little things here and there but that's you know that's ordinary right i mean yeah. that happens there's going to be little things here and there i mean if you couldn't see the roofs because it was all flat roofs let's say and that you were told by the seller or by the broker oh yeah the roofs were just redone you know a year or two ago and then you're in due diligence and your roofing company goes up there and they're like, yeah, these all need to get replaced. This could be hundreds of thousands of dollars and really changes the metrics. Then you need to have a conversation. Fortunately, we haven't been in that situation. Um, and, but it, it can happen. And I hear stories about it all the time. You just had a, had an yeah. issue. Yeah, yeah, and unfortunately, if you're putting money hard up front, those conversations, there's not much leverage on the buyer side uh, when, when that, if, if something like that comes to light. But again, I, you know, I think, um, you know, even like such as a roof issue, like if, if you're going to put a quarter million up hard, you know, you can, you can, you can uh, even mentioning a fly roof, can't see it, get a drone, fly it up there, right? You can still overcome those types of things prior, prior to, you know, putting up that hard money. Yeah. Again, the, the example I just provided, I don't want to scare anyone that's listening that that is very much an anomaly. It's the first time for me, first time for many of the folks that I've spoken with our attorney that's done tens of thousands of transactions. And um, in any event, uh, don't, don't expect going into a deal that you're going to be provided doctored financials or, <laughs> or going to be you know, given fraudulent information in any event. Um, maybe on a small uh, Kevin, little, I, I do have yeah. a question about sure, that. I'm sure. just curious to know, like, uh, <laughs> if, if there was like hard money involved or something no, like that, uh, would you yet. be able to take oh, legal action? Yeah, I mean, I would hard, assume there was you hard, could. If there was hard money, yeah, but I mean, our you know our our loss costs or you know, pursuit costs are probably about fifty k, and you know now you're talking. Is it does it make sense to file a lawsuit? I mean, we have a really really good case. I mean, it would it would uh, it, it would stand the test of time in front of a judge, um, but are you going to rack up more money in that lawsuit? And ultimately what do you sure. want out of it? It's just a recoup of costs, right? And is it worth the brain damage to go through? If it was $500,000, very different story, 50,000, you know, I almost chalk it up to the cost of doing business and a, and a lesson learned. And I don't know what that lesson is because I've never dealt with a professional con artist seller in my life. Um, not to the extent of this wow. it was a $30 million transaction. So, I mean, it wasn't some small little transaction and um, in any event, it is what it is. Lesson learned. Not sure exactly what the lesson is yet, but um, <laughs> still working on that one. But uh, yeah, it's not worth pursuing um, any uh, legal recourse on it. But uh, if I was in a case such as a multi in the multifamily side where you guys are truly putting up hard money up front, absolutely, you bet your you bet your butt that uh, we'd be going after. But I don't think that would I don't think that would happen. I just um, it's a very I think it's a very different profile of sellers and 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 um, folks that are in the the larger multifamily space. Not saying that there might be a few you know, uh, shady operators or characters out there. But, you know, for the most part, these are larger investment groups. I mean, these are professionally run organizations and, and um, you've got professional attorney, uh, pro you know, professional, well, reputable attorneys that are, you know, managing these transactions and facilitating these transactions, brokers that have a rep rep you know, reputation to uphold and what have you. And so I just think that it's uh, much slimmer of a chance of, of it occurring in, in that industry than this was a parking uh, parking lot deal, portfolio of parking lots. And, and ultimately what have we found uh, over the last two years of being in this parking lot industry is that it's, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of the best terminology for it. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a, a mixed bag of professional and just fly by the seat of your pants. Uh, you know, we figure this out as we go and there's not too many, um, you know, there's not too many, you know, large eyes looking down upon us. So we do what we want to do. So, it's um it's an interesting industry to be in for sure. Very similar to that of the mobile home park space ten years ago when we first jumped into it. Now it's it seemingly got a little bit more professional and um uh, and refined over the last decade. But parking lots not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so in any event, well, Matt, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show. Really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story, your background, and um, you know particulars about what you guys are working on. You know how you look at deals, how you underwrite things, and and uh, just excited to watch your growth and wishing you guys all the best. And um, yeah, I guess before we wrap it up here, if there's any advice that you could share with, you know, aspiring folks that are maybe, maybe where you were five or 10 years ago, what advice would you give them? Oh, um, this is not a, uh, a, a business where you succeed very quickly. Um, I think this is a, a, a slow business. Um, you know, it took me, 
you know, I, I feel like I've hit my stride now and I'm having some success, but you know, I've been in the business uh, full time going at it pretty hard for six years. And so it's just something that, that builds up over time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, hang in there, uh, keep fighting the good fight. Uh, no, you know, know what, what your parameters are and the kind of deals that you're looking for and what you're willing to do and what you're not and stick to your guns. Slow and steady wins the race, as they say. Well, Matt, for those that want to learn more about you and what you got going on, where's the best place to find you? Go to my website, Pacheni.com. I'll spell that. It's P-I-C-H-E-N-Y.com. Uh, at Pacheni.com, you can sign up for my newsletter um, and, and check out my new book that just came out. You can, you know, there's a link to it right there. Um, it's called Backstage Guide to Real Estate. And it, it would be actually, I think, a really good book that would add a lot of value to, to those uh, readers in your audience. And uh, if you get it before the official launch on February 9th, it's on, on a major discount right now. So you might want to check it up. You can get the digital version for just 99 cents. Okay. Fantastic. Well, guys, we'll put that in the show notes. And uh, Matt, again, a pleasure meeting you. Appreciate you coming on the show and uh, sharing a little bit of a background of yourself and your business. So it's been a lot of fun having you. Thanks, Kevin. It was a pleasure. Alrighty, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success. Take care. Thank <music> you.